Hello, everybody. Welcome to the National Constitution Center's Classes on the Constitution. My name is Carrie Sotner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And today we're going to be with you for 30 minutes to go through the Constitutional Convention. What a perfect way to have a class in September all about the Constitutional Convention. <laughs> As always, I'm not by myself, and thank goodness for that, I get to bring along amazing scholars. So our top scholar today is Tom Donnelly. Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Donnelly. I am a Senior Fellow for Constitutional Studies at the National Constitution Center. So happy to be here with you. What a great way to have an early celebration of Constitution Day. Awesome, Tom. I know you're excited, and I'm excited, but we want to say something before we get started. We love to talk about the Constitution, we love to talk about the Convention, but we also love questions from you. So if you have questions now, later, or even after class, please feel free to put them in the Q&A, the chat, or email us. You should all have my email. We are always willing to answer questions, and sometimes those questions pop up two days later, and we totally understand that. So send them our way, and let's dive into the Constitutional Convention. So we begin with looking at kind of the big ideas behind the Constitutional Convention. And we always talk about big questions that we have. You know, why did they decide to write a constitution in the first place? How is it different than the documents that our government was working under prior to that? And then what are the main compromises going on? But Tom, I thought it would be fun to ask you this question. What are your three big things that you would want everybody to know about the Constitutional Convention or the general Constitution before we jump into this class? Sure, just a, a few quick things. You could say so many. You know, one is the idea of popular sovereignty. So this is what we get in the preamble of the Constitution, those words, we the people, that all power in the American government derives from the American people. Two, and something that I think is really, really cool is in the Constitution itself, there's a mechanism for making it better. And so we have an amendment process so that over time we learn from our experience and make the constitution better. And the last thing, and we'll really get at this when we get to the convention, is you know it really forces us to think about the role of compromise and when we're willing to compromise our principles in certain ways in order to get things done or when we, there are just certain lines we're not willing to cross. And so I think the compromises at the convention force us to really face that question of compromise really squarely. I think that's fantastic, Tom. And I will always think about that too. It's the compromise that happens at the convention for good or for bad, but also the methods of civil dialogue that they use at the convention. So, so often we talk about what comes out of the convention, what things they did or didn't do. But I also like to talk about the process. You know, I'm obsessed with how they do stuff and the formula that they follow and like, you know, you only can trust the process if you understand the process. So let's dive into all of that. Um, let's begin with um, one announcement for everybody. Somewhere on the back end, Zoom changed the rules and they disabled the chat. So I will fix that for the next class. But until then, put all your questions or just random comments. P please feel free to put them in the Q&A because I can see that and I can answer that. But before we dive into the Constitutional Convention and how it led to September 17th in Philadelphia 234 years ago, let's start with the actual Constitution. What is the Constitution made of, Tom? What do we have in it? And what did they do in Philadelphia? Absolutely. So the Constitution, it's made up of a preamble, seven articles, 27 amendments. The preamble, we, I've already mentioned, which is, it's those key words, we, the people, which expresses this principle of popular sovereignty, all power in Americans, the American government being derived from the American people themselves. Then articles one through three of the Constitution lay out the three branches of government. Article one gives us the legislative branch, Congress, which is tasked with making the laws. Article two lays out the executive branch led by a single president responsible for enforcing the laws. And article three outlines the judicial branch with the Supreme Court as the nation's highest court with the duty to interpret the laws. And so that's articles one through three. The rest of the constitution then gives us, you know, a few other important details with article four addressing the relationship between the states and their citizens dealing with how to handle the admission of new states and how to govern the federal territories. It also includes the infamous Fugitive Slave Clause. Article five, I mentioned at the outset, this is the process for amending the constitution. The founders didn't think that they had a monopoly on constitutional wisdom. They expected us to make the constitution better over time. Article six establishes the supremacy of national law 
over the laws of the states. And Article 7 sets out the process for ratifying the Constitution. This is that process after the Convention of Philadelphia, where by state by state, the American people had to say yes or no to the new Constitution. Again, this is a deep expression of the founders' commitment to popular sovereignty. Fantastic. And by the way, I just fixed the chat, so chat away in there. Uh, now, Tom, every other, all those 27 amendments that come later all happen after this. So when we talk about the Constitutional Convention, it really is that structural constitution from the preamble through all the articles. But also what we have to think about is it wasn't like uh, the Big Bang moment. We were, we were actually slightly like a country prior to the Constitution. And we had these, the, when they came to the Constitutional Convention, they had already had a governing document and they already had lived experiences of what was working and not working. And I always think this part is so fascinating because you're like, you never hear about it. And then you realize, well, they didn't come with blank slates. They came with, hey, we have a list of things that are totally working and a list of things that are train wrecks. So let's talk about, you know, <laughs> my favorite train wreck, the Articles of Confederation. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that, that, that's a great point, Curry, that the Constitution doesn't come out of nowhere. It's coming out of the experiences we had living under, number one, the Articles of Confederation. This is the framework of national government that existed before the U.S. Constitution. If there's one big thing to know about the Articles of Confederation, it's that it created a weak national government, a, what they called a League of Friendship, where we really have the states continuing to have a great deal of power and independence. There were certain key structural features of the Articles of Confederation that also the delegates in Philadelphia had in mind. One of them is that the Articles of Confederation, it really only had a legislative branch. Its governing body was just Congress. It was a single Congress. Each state would send delegates to this Congress and each state, regardless of its population, would receive one vote. And so there's not a separate executive branch. There's not a separate judicial branch. Everything is lodged in that one Congress. The other important thing is that that Congress was given very few powers. And so many of the powers we think the national government needs to have to govern a nation properly, things like the power to tax, the power to raise an army. You know, these are the sorts of things that the government under the Articles of Confederation couldn't do. And so in part, what the founding generation is trying to do in Philadelphia with this new constitution is to thread an important needle. On the one hand, they want a government that's more powerful than the one created by the Articles of Confederation. But on the other hand, they still wanted a government of, nation, of limited powers. We didn't cast off the British Empire in an American Revolution concerned about abuses by a powerful government put, to put a new abusive distant government in its place. And so that's in part the delegates are trying to thread that needle between the Articles of Confederation and the British Empire. And I love the way you explain it. And it's so clearly like, it's like a pendulum. You know, we were too far to one side with the British government and having no voice and agency. And then we, we swung that pendulum a little far to the other side with the Articles of Confederation where everybody is perfectly equal and there's no weighing system and not a lot of centralized power. And it really wasn't working. Like I, I joke that it was a train wreck, but it was really falling apart. And I guess the best singular story to tell that to what was going on and how at risk we were is Shay's Rebellion. And I know a ton of our teachers love to teach about this, but there's a million other things going on in the country at that time. There's, you know, the British pulling off our soldiers from their boats um, or, or seamen from their boats, the waterways being blocked by Spain. We've got a lot of collapsing going on internally and externally but this is the one that really worries the leadership in our country the most. So tell us about Shay's Rebellion and what happened there. That's absolutely right. And I mean, part of the problem too, Curry, was, was structural with the Articles too. We see all of these problems. There, and even people who would go on to oppose the new constitution thought the Articles were imperfect, but the Articles of Confederation could only be amended by the unanimous approval of the states. So even as everyone thought the Articles of Confederation were lousy, we couldn't change them. The other thing is the founding generation, they're responding to their experience under state constitutions during this period. We create state constitutions state by state, but when the founders look at these state constitutions, they see governments that really are creating two powerful legislative branches, branch, uh, governments with not enough power to the executive branch and the judiciary. And so they're seeing these state governments in their view, too closely tethered to the people and making really lousy decisions. 
And so we have this weak Articles of Confederation, we have these flawed state governments, and then we see this explosion, this challenge, the threat of mob violence in Shays' Rebellion. Shays' Rebellion itself, it's in late 1786. These are farmers in Western Massachusetts. Who's Shays? Well, he's Daniel Shays. He's a 39-year-old farmer in Massachusetts. He was a veteran from the American Revolution. He fought in Lexington and Bunker Hill. And he was part of this, the, the, you know, many Americans who felt that the national government wasn't doing, you know, wasn't really looking after their interests, but their state governments weren't either. And so we see these farmers, they have massive debts. We see the government foreclosing on their farms. And we see an economy that's in a, in, in a downward spiral. And as a result, these farmers take it upon themselves to arm themselves and march across Western Massachusetts. They shut down court buildings to prevent the state governments from foreclosing on their farms. They shut down debtors' prisons. And they're, they're, they're attempting to commandeer the arsenal in Springfield, Massachusetts. They wanted to arm themselves further and march to the state government in Boston because they wanted to be heard. And for the founding generation, for people like George Washington, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton, Part of the alarm is that the Articles of Confederation, the national government, can't do anything to stop this. So it's not the national government that's putting down this rebellion of farmers in Massachusetts. It's a militia in Massachusetts. And so the concern here for the founders, people like Washington, Madison, and Hamilton, isn't just this single rebellion in Western Massachusetts. It's a concern that this could be just the first act of mob violence among many. And so they really thought it was important to form a new government. And so they push hard for a, a, a convention with the convention we have in Philadelphia. Congress says, sure, you can meet in Philadelphia for the quote, sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. What we know is that Madison and his friends had other plans. <laughs> this is a lovely way to say it. I think one of the things that like I had the aha moment when we were talking about this like six months ago is that they are watching these state governments and these 13 different state governments and they're looking at uh, Pennsylvania and I can pick on Pennsylvania because that's where I'm from and saying like Pennsylvania is a train wreck of a state government it's not working but that they thought Massachusetts was the good one that they thought that was the state government that was really working so to see kind of this rebellion in the best state government that they have also is like an added freak out that we've got a big problem here. If our best is getting to this point, then we need to really change the system. And I think that's what I find so fascinating is when why we tell this story and we tend to tell it as the singular story, but there's all these other pieces. And the storyline is, if this is what's happening in our best state, then we've got lots of flaws to this system and we need to get together to change it. And maybe it's more than the sole purpose. So they get together in Philadelphia, it's May. They all start to gather in Philadelphia in early May, 1787. They get a quorum, enough people to have the meeting, a majority by um, May 25th, 1787. And this is my favorite part of the, the program, Tom. Let's talk about who the students see. So students take a look at the painting, zoom in really closely and see if you recognize anybody in the painting. And I just will always point out that amazing blue leisure suit in the center of the painting. So feel free to see who you, okay. So Ryan says he's noticed Go Governor Morris. Um, feel free to shout out where he looks like, but um, Tom, who's your favorite, favorite person in the painting so far? Well, I, th I think it's the most notable thing to point out are the two most fe famous people in the painting, where we have George Washington standing astride at the front of the room. And then you already said, Curry, Benjamin Franklin in his blue leisure suit there. And this is so important for the Constitutional Convention. Madison and Hamilton fight, you know, work very, very hard to make sure that George Washington is in that room, that he's elected the president of the convention, precisely because if Washington's there, if Franklin's there, probably the two most beloved Americans, everyone will know, everyone will know that something important is going on inside that room. You know, just a couple of other things to flag about the convention, Curry. You know, one thing is that the proceedings were in secret. And so we have a secret convention. They, you know, they, they, they close it up, make sure there aren't any leaks. And part of that is to allow for the candor in the discussions that you have in the convention. The idea is we're discussing big, difficult issues. We want people to feel free to change their minds and to be convinced by arguments from other people. And so we have this secret convention. It runs from May up until September 17th, 1787. It's in the Pennsylvania State House, now known as Independence Hall, which is right across from the National Constitution Center. It's one of the most inspiring things about getting to work where we work. 
Um, you know, uh, you know, a couple of other things is that the delegates themselves are being selected by their states. And so it's 12 of the 13 states select delegations to go to Philadelphia, Rhode Island, cranky Rhode Island decides <laughs> not to send any delegates. They're afraid of the creation of a new, powerful, abusive national government. You know, the, the delegates themselves, they're fairly young. The, the average age of the delegates is 42 which to me sounds pretty young, but you know, in the end, it's, it, it's young. And you have to remember that age is being skewed by Benjamin Franklin, the oldest member of the convention. Most of the convention delegates are lawyers. And finally, there are two really, really important people that are not in the room in Philadelphia. One is Thomas Jefferson. He's in France. And the other is John Adams. And he's in England. In the end, the Constitution is ratified on June 21st, 1788. And the first meeting of the first Congress is on March 4th. 1789. Awesome. And Tom, um, question for you, because I always find this fascinating when we look at these pictures and I love this graphic where you can see who everybody is. We tend to know like the big names like Washington and Franklin. Now we know Hamilton, but I, I'm telling you, like when I first started working at the Constitution Center 15 years ago, nobody knew who Hamilton was. Um, and I'm really happy about that play because it, the musical really helped that how many people were at the convention over the entire summer? Because we tend to just try to remember the ones who signed it on the 17th and the three that didn't sign it on the 17th. But I remember learning about this and finding it fascinating that it was really like a revolving door. People were coming and going, even Hamilton. He was gone for like the entire month of July during this convention. So can you talk a little bit about how the delegates kind of were in and out and why they were in and out. Um, and then how we get down kind of to the select few in the last few days. Of course, so, I mean, there's 55 different delegates through the course of the summer. Some people are, are, are leaving the convention in protest. And so part of the reason Hamilton may have left is because New York didn't have a quorum for a lot of the convention because important New York delegates, William Ye Yates and John Lansing looked at what was happening in Philadelphia and they were appalled. They thought that the Philadelphia, the convention was creating too powerful a national government. And they, so they returned back to New York and reported back to the powerful governor, George Clinton there, what was going on. And they would lead the anti-federalist charge, those opposing the new constitution after the constitutional convention. Luther Mar Martin is another example uh, from Maryland, an important figure at the constitutional convention who ends up leaving. Um, so again, you have people sort of coming and going. In the end, what is it, Curry? 42 were there at the end, 39 sign? with three dissenters, the three people refusing to sign the constitution are George Mason, Edmund Randolph and Elbridge Gerry. Mind you, they refused to sign even after Benjamin Franklin has a, has a famous closing speech to the convention asking the delegates to set aside their own arrogance, to have a little humility and to unite around signing this new constitution. Mason, Gerry and Randolph said, that's nice, Mr. Franklin, but no, 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 we're not gonna sign. <laughs> Uh, they're like, we'll keep our humility, but we want a Bill of Rights. Um, and I think it's really fascinating. Again, go back to how did the convention work and that fluidity of people in and out. I, I want you to write a book, Tom, that's all about the guys not in the painting. Because I find some of those people, like the really, like Luther Martin, I find just so unbelievably interesting. Like, and he's in so many of the debates that we're going to talk about in the next couple of minutes, but you don't see him in the painting. But I also love the idea because of the people coming and going that if they had a vote on a particular issue, it was the rule that later on in two weeks, if you wanted to bring that back and say, let's talk about it again, you could do that. So it helped things move along, but it also made it comfortable that if we moved it along, it didn't mean the door was closed and we could never go back to it. They wound up going back to it less than they thought they would, but it was really a brilliant way to increase civil dialogue and discussion and move compromise along. So for us, just a note of what we can learn from the, the proceedings, but let's talk about those difficult conversations, sometimes those tragic conversations and what they had a debate about over that. Let's be honest, it was a long, it was a hot, and because it's Philadelphia in the 1700s, a super smelly summer. And they're in like wool with the windows closed because it's in secret. So let's talk a little bit about the compromises under that atmosphere. Sure, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the Connecticut or Great Compromise, the compromise of the Electoral College, and then the tragic compromises over slavery. So let's begin with the Connecticut or Great Compromise. So the big issue here with this compromise is how were we going to organize power in Congress? 
And so you have big debates between states with a lot of people and states with not so many people. And so the big debates here are over how are we going to decide how many, how many representatives in Congress each state gets. And so we have two big plans on the table during this, th these debates. You know, one is the Virginia plan, which is the brainchild of James Madison. It's introduced in the Constitutional Convention near the beginning by Virginia's Edmund Randolph, and it would help frame a lot of the debates that happen at the convention itself. The Virginia plan calls for two big things in this context. One, it says that we should divide the power of Congress between two houses. And so we should have, in, in the end, we'll have a United States House and a US Senate. But the big idea here is that the framers are really concerned Congress is going to be the most powerful, most dangerous branch. They want to divide power into two houses of Congress. And then importantly, what Madison calls for is that the number of seats in each of those houses of Congress is going to be determined by population. And so if the more populous states are going to get more representatives than the less popular states. The so large states, more representatives than the small states. And so for, you know, a large state like Virginia is going to make off really well, as is Pennsylvania. As you might expect, the small states are like, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not going to give away too much political power to the large states, get swallowed up in this new national government. And so William Patterson brings forth what's known as the New Jersey plan, which is the counter proposal to the Virginia plan. And it's the small states coming back and saying, no, we like the way power is structured in the Articles of Confederation. Thank you very much. So we're going to stick with a single Congress and each state's going to get the same number of votes, whether it's a really big state or a really small state, equal state representation. In the end, the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise is brought forth by Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth from Connecticut, not surprisingly given the name of the compromise. And what they do is they split the difference between the Virginia and the New Jersey plan. They say, yes, congressional power, we want it to be divided. So we're going to have two houses, a U.S. House and a U.S. Senate. We're going to organize power and representation differently in the two houses. In the U.S. House of Representatives, we're going to do it like the Virginia plan said. The U.S. House of Representatives is going to be organized by population, so the more populous states get more representatives. And then finally, we're going to have a U.S. Senate, where each state is going to get two senators regardless of its population. So the Senate's going to be organized around the principle of equal state representation. Now, we may think a compromise is often like a, 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 a coming together moment, but people were, you know, there were, there were great divisions over this particular issue. It almost tore the convention apart. It ends up being approved by a single vote. And key delegates like James Madison hated this compromise. He saw, thought the Virginia plan was better. But in the end, the, the convention uh, uh, ends up uh, agreeing to the great compromise in this organization into two houses of Congress, a U.S. House, a U.S. Senate, the U.S. House organized by population, the U.S. Senate by equal state representation. Awesome. That is fantastic. So in like kind of a summary nutshell, the Connecticut compromise is a great compromise is the discussion debate kind of a small battle about Article One of the United States Constitution. Article One says, how are we gonna make sure that in government there's representatives for all the people in each state? And how do we make sure it's fair between states, big and small, and how their voices are heard in making the laws? And that's the job of um, the legislative branch, right, Tom, is to be able to write the laws and make the laws. So they, they have a lot of voice, they have a lot of power, so they wanted to make sure that each state had the right amount of voice and power in that government. So that's a fair summary, Tom? Absolutely. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Now we're moving on to probably one of the more confusing debates and discussions, the Electoral College. So the idea is Article 2 of the Constitution is the presidency. And one of the discussions they have to figure out in different parts of the Constitution is how do we get a new president? Should we have a king? Should we have a group of people? What should the presidency look like? We all now know what it looks like, but every few years we talk about this electoral college. So what was their plan and reasoning behind it, Tom? Yeah, so the electoral college is, you know, this is the, this body of 538 electors drawn from the states and the District of Columbia that select our president. Um, and so in the end, you know, when, when we go to vote on election day, the American people, uh, you know, they vote for president and vice president, but these votes don't directly determine the outcome of the election. Technically, these popular votes determine which electors are appointed to the electoral college. The electors eventually meet in December to cast their votes for president and vice president. And if a candidate receives a majority of the electoral vote in the electoral college, they're president. 
even if they lose the popular vote, and if there is not a majority around any particular candidate, if everyone's underneath the majority of the votes, then the election is decided in the U.S. House of Representatives with the states voting by state delegation. <clears throat> so the Electoral College, how do we end up with this compromise? Well, part of it, 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 it's related to larger debates over the presidency itself. And so the delegates themselves, they really struggled with how to structure the presidency. They couldn't find a great example of what they were looking for in history or their own lived experience. So if they looked at their state governors in the, in, in the various state constitutions at the time, they would say those governors are too weak. They'd look to Europe and they'd say, wait a minute, there's a bunch of monarchs there. Those monarchs are too strong. And so with the presidency itself, they wanted to find, they wanted to find sort of a balance between you know, a, a president that was stronger than the weak state governors at the time, but weaker than a king. And so part of these big debates are debates over how they're going to elect a president. And so you have different ideas on the table. You have James Wilson of Pennsylvania, one of my great heroes saying, no, the easiest way, the best way to select a president is a popular vote, a national popular vote. He didn't find a lot of takers, but he was an influential delegate. And so he's saying a direct popular vote for president Many, many, many delegates supported congressional election of the president so that Congress would select the president, Congress being the body, at least theoretically, of the most informed, knowledgeable members of society. So why not have Congress select the president? In the end, the Electoral College is a compromise between these two positions. And so, you know, for someone like James Wilson, he doesn't have a lot of support for popular elections. So he looks at the Electoral College and he says, this is probably the closest I'm going to get to the direct popular vote. And I think over time, as we structure the Electoral College, we're leaving a lot of decision making to the states on how to decide those electors. I think over time, that's going to become a more democratic process. And that as a result, we're going to get something close to a direct popular vote for president. And in the end, James Wilson's quite right about that prediction. For those delegates who support a congressional election for the president, though, they looked at it and said, look, this, is a, this, is, this system is going to be congressional election by another means. There aren't going to be national figures that can win a majority in the Electoral College. So their prediction was 19 elections out of 20 are going to go to the U.S. House of Representatives anyway, because that candidate's not going to get a majority of, the, of the, the votes in the Electoral College. And so those who support a congressional election thought the Electoral College would help narrow the choices in the field. But in the end, the decision would be made by Congress. They were wrong in that prediction. But you know, no one really knew how this was gonna play out. So that was maybe a reasonable assumption at the time. And then finally, for more elitist delegates like Alexander Hamilton, they looked at the Electoral College and said, this is gonna be an independent body of some of our best and brightest making the decision. This guards against the dangers of demagogues fooling the people. And also it's a way to give the president itself um, broad, a broad base of, nat of independent support that's different than Congress. It's going to be this electoral college is going to decide the president and dissolve thereafter, giving the presidency greater independence. And as a result, giving the presidency greater power to check Congress. Again, the delegates think that's going to be the most powerful branch, but check Congress when it goes astray. So it is definitely a tricky system. And I know we're going to dive into it later in the year. And I can share with everybody the the other videos that we have and the other materials we have on the Electoral College, because it's tricky. Actually, it's next month that we'll dive into it even more. But the last thing that we're gonna go over are two big other compromises that happened at the convention. And it's, it's a good discussion to have, and it comes up quite often. And these are the compromises on slavery. We're gonna look at the two parts of the structural constitution, the three-fifths clause and the slave trade clause. So Tom, kind of tell us where they fall in the constitution and what was the debate and discussion and why are these in the constitution and how are these for some people so for many people believe it wasn't enough and other people said it could have been even worse or stronger so kind of unpack that in the last few minutes yeah, absolutely so i mean obviously slavery in america is older than the u.s constitution i mean it's written into the colonial law as early as the 1660s in places like virginia and the carolinas in the 1700s american slavery expands but as we fast forward to the constitutional convention it, you know it's fair to ask what role does the issue of, of slavery play at the convention itself well all told 25 of the 55 convention delegates held enslaved people so the, the institution of slavery is important to these delegates' own personal wealth and the economies of their states. You know, at the convention itself, the framers refused to write the word slave or slavery into the Constitution. They also refused to recognize the right to property 
in men. However, they did compromise in important ways with the slaveholding delegates, and they left the issue of slavery largely to the states, for the states to ultimately decide whether they want to be free or to allow people to hold enslaved people. So, you know, the two big compromises we flag here are the compromises are the three-fifths compromise and the compromise over the international slave trade. The three-fifths compromise grows out of that, that debate we already uh, discussed over Congress. So remember, the U.S. House of Representatives, it's organized by population. The greater the population of the state, the more representatives it gets in Congress. The more representatives it gets in Congress, the more political power it has in our national government. And so these are the stakes are really high as we see sectional tension, tensions growing between the North and South throughout American history, it, the stakes are very high as to which part of the country is gonna have more political power in Congress. We see slaveholding delegates argue that, well, you know, the, the, the big debate here is how are we gonna count enslaved people for the purposes of that population calculation in the US House of Representatives? How are we going to count enslaved people for the purposes of congressional representation? The slaveholding states argue that's easy count our enslaved people as a full person, five-fifths of a person, give us credit and political power for the number of enslaved people that we hold. Northern delegates, especially some anti-slavery delegates like, Pennsylvania, like, uh, by Pencil like Pennsylvania's Governor Morris, argue, no, 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 that makes no sense. We should not count enslaved, we believe enslaved people are full people, but if what we're talking about is political power here, we're not gonna credit the slaveholding states for the number of enslaved people they hold. And so for purposes of congressional representation and slave people should count as zero fifths of a person. We shouldn't bump up the political power of the slave holding states based on how many people they hold in slavery. In the end, we see another compromise here by the convention. Um, and what the, what the delegates come around to is we're gonna count enslaved people as three fifths of a person for purposes of congressional um, representation. It ends up being really, really important practically speaking over time. Because what it does is it increases the pro-slavery strength of the slaveholding states in Congress by, by counting enslaved people as three fifths of a person. In turn, this boosts their power in the presidency by increasing the, the power that they have in the electoral college. And then finally, it even increases their power over the Supreme Court as the nation elects more people with pro-slavery sympathies to the presidency. And then those presidents select the Supreme Court justices. And I think it's really important to kind of point out this huge impact that the three fifths clause has. Um, and really clearly for everybody, it's for representation. It's not saying you have three fifths of the rights of other people, it's only for representation. So it's giving the people in power, the, many of the white male slave owners, able more power to control it in, in the national government and in their states as well. So I think that's really powerful. And Colin asked a question about, but what are the other, what about the other parts of the constitution that have to deal with slavery. And I think that's a really good question, Colin. We're not saying there isn't other parts of the constitution that have to deal with slavery. These are the two that were highly debated at the convention. So other, um, the fugitive slave clause, that definitely is in there. But, and we'll dive into this in more detail when we look at slavery in America in November, but it, it was a pretty easy ad. They were okay with that. This is the ones that were debated. So the other big debate is on the international slave trade. So Tom, can you pull wrap us up with that? And then everybody, we're gonna wrap up after this, but feel free to ask questions in the chat. Absolutely, so I mean, by the founding, even many uh, slaveholders opposed the inhumane Atlantic slave trade. So if, when we're in the Constitutional Convention itself, it's really only delegates from Georgia and South Carolina that are fighting hard to maintain this brutal practice. And frankly, South Carolina almost leaves the convention over this issue. And so this leads to heated debates at the convention itself. For instance, here is Maryland's Luther Martin. He attacked the international slave trade as quote, inconsistent with the principles of the revolution and dishonorable to the American character. We have key delegates like George Mason, John Dickinson and Rufus King saying, no, we need to ban the international slave trade now. We need to write that into the constitution. In, in, you know, in reply, we see delegates from the deep South like John Rutland saying, you do that, we're leaving the convention. And so the, in the end, the delegates reach another compromise. In the end, they say Congress will have the power to ban the international slave trade, but only 20 years after the ratification of the Constitution. So only on January 1st, 1808, will Congress have this power. Um, and this has a huge practical effect. So between 1788 and 1808, the number of enslaved people brought into the United States exceeded 200,000 people brought in during that 20 year period 
Congress finally had the power in 1808 to abolish the international slave trade, and it did it immediately. So Congress bans the international slave trade in 1808. Uh, but again, that's 20 years between the ratification of the Constitution and that moment. Thank you, Tom. So as we dive into kind of kicking off Constitution Week, it is one of those, my favorite topics to talk about, to talk about how do we get a constitution? What do they put into the constitution and why and how is their process of building it and how, what can we learn from that today? So I love this class because we talk about all the parts. We talk about the celebratory moments and the tragedies as well. And we dive into it till we understand our framing of our constitution. We celebrate the constitutional convention, but we also recognize the unbelievable tragedy in the constitution around slavery as well. So Tom, thank you so much. This was a fantastic class. We've got it in 35 minutes, everyone. And again, if later on you're wondering, hey, what about this? Please shoot us an email. Tom and I will jump back in and continue the conversation. And with that, uh, we have a two o'clock class today. And on Friday is our public celebration of Constitution Day. It happens a day earlier because Constitution Day falls on a Saturday. We're doing two days of it because that's just fun. Um, and if you want to join in with our conversations on Friday, there is a ton of programming online. Um, and we are going to talk about some of the documents over time that have influenced our constitution. So not just from 1787, but the civil rights time period and modern. So Tom, thank you so much for class. Everybody will send a follow-up and happy constitution week. Thank you, Curry. Hi, Thanks, Cunningham Tom. class. Good to see you. I know. Nice to see them, right? <laughs> Thanks, Colin. Okay. I officially stopped recording. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Great. Okay. My Zoom went wacky on me a few times, and I'm sorry all the slides were deleting. It's because it was my cursor was stuck in the chat and wouldn't, what kept changing the slides. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> see you later, Colin. Thank you.